Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Peter Burton. I'm a board member with Heritage Toronto, and I'm going to be your board member representative this evening. Um, I'd like to start by doing a land acknowledgement. Um, Heritage Toronto is located on the traditional territory of the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Anishinaabe, including the Chippewas and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, Toronto is host to many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people. Toronto is within the territory of the Dish With One Spoon Treaty, which requires responsibility of those who use the land to share it peaceably and care for it. Heritage Toronto acknowledges this responsibility and recognizes the efforts of these nations in maintaining the land. Founded in 1949, we acknowledge that Heritage Toronto has contributed to the colonial historical narrative. We are working to amend that by engaging with Indigenous communities to incorporate more of their stories into our programming. Plaques with colonial, uh, plaques with colonial language are being revised, Indigenous content is being integrated into our walking tours, and in the future, we hope to expand our Indigenous programming. A little bit about Heritage Toronto. Heritage Toronto is a charity and agency of the City of Toronto that celebrates our city's rich heritage and the diverse stories of its people, places, and events. Through our programs, including tours, plaques, state of heritage report, and online exhibits, we engage the public to reflect on the past, both to make sense of our present and to inform our future. I'd like to thank our 2021 presenting sponsor, TD, as well as our four sponsors, Andrew and Sharon Himmel and the Himmel family and the Ontario Association of Architects. Without their support, these tours would not be possible. A couple of reminders uh, that if you have any questions during the tour, please enter them using the Q&A button, not the chat button, but the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and we will answer the questions at the end. Closed captioning in English is available during this virtual tour. If you'd like to turn on closed captioning, please click the button mark, mark CC on the Zoom menu at the bottom of your screen, uh, usually at the bottom of your screen on the right. Um, now I'd like to introduce our tour leader. Your tour leader today, Ori Abrara, is an urban planner who holds a Bachelor of Environmental Studies, Honors Planning from the University of Waterloo. Her interest in cultural heritage is linked to its ability to bring communities together through storytelling of the past and as part of the building blocks of the future. So with that, I'd like to uh, pass that off to Ori and uh, we'll talk again at the end of the tour. Excellent, thank you, Peter. Um, I will get this going. <clears throat> Welcome everyone. Today we'll be exploring the neighborhood of St. Jamestown. It houses over 18,000 residents, making it one of Canada's most densely populated communities and one of the most densely populated neighborhoods in North America. The neighborhood we'll be virtually walking through today is bounded by Bloor Street to east to the north, uh, Parliament Street to the east, Wellesley Street East to the South and Sherburne Street to the West. My name, of course, is Oria Barra, and I'm excited to take you through the neighborhood today. As you heard, I have a background in urban planning. So along with the history of the neighborhood, I'll also be talking about a planning concept called Towers in the Park. And we'll talk a little bit about how uh, about new developments happening in the neighborhood. Um, and if we were standing at our very first stop, I would have you look around and you'd be able to see the whole of St. Jamestown and see that it's going through some changes and transitions. Today we'll explore how this neighborhood transformed into the high rise village we see today. Over the next hour or so, I'll be talking about the neighborhood's physical development and change from the Victorian age to current day. Along the way, I'll talk about some different events and societal shifts that have influenced development in the area, along with the community. I'm excited about this tour because I found it really interesting to research and write about this neighborhood, uh, since initially I wasn't very familiar with the community. 
It's clear that the neighborhood's in transition and it's been an ever evolving community pretty much since its beginnings. The great thing about these tours is that you can listen in and learn about stories you've never heard before. Hopefully that will be your experience today and you'll leave this tour knowing just a little bit more about this part of our city. St. Jamestown is located on Treaty 13 lands, which were part of the Toronto Purchase. Following the American Revolution in the 18th century, many loyalists resettled on lands on the northern banks of the Great Lakes, where the Mississaugas lived. The original Toronto Purchase of 1787 was negotiated between the British and the Mississaugas of the Credit and generally included the western portions um, of the city of Toronto, Vaughan, King, and western portions of Richmond Hill. You can see that in orange. The validity of the original agreement was never confirmed. So in 1805, the treaty was revised and the Crown purchased over 250,000 acres of land, um, including the lands on which, where St. Jamestown are, is located, all for about 10 shillings, which equates to about $30, um, along with a few other items. Disagreements regarding the treaty didn't end there, and eventually it led to a $145 million settlement between the Government of Canada and the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation in 2010. Before St. Jamestown developed into what it looks like today, it would have been a very forested area and Indigenous peoples likely moved through the area and lose, used the lands. It's located nearby to the Rosedale Ravine, which would have been part of the various Indigenous trail networks that, connect, that connected many of the different rivers across the city that would have been used for trade. Eventually, Settlers arrived on the banks of Lake Ontario and people began to settle in this area called St. Jamestown. The name St. Jamestown is likely derived from the nearby cemetery chapel called the Chapel of St. James the Less. The chapel is located in the southern part of the St. James uh, Cemetery, which is on the east side of Parliament. And the chapel itself is located closer to the intersection of Parliament and Wellesley Streets. John G. Howard first laid out the plans for the St. James Cemetery and Chapel back in 1842, and the cemetery opened in 1844. By 1857, the local architectural firm of Cumberland and Storm, who also designed um, the Cathedral Church of St. James uh, south of here at King and Church Streets, was selected to design the chapel, and the chapel was completed in 1860. The chapel itself is a very good example of high Victorian Gothic design, um, especially since it's located within a very picturesque setting, perched on a hill and surrounded by uh, lots of greenery. It's also a municipally listed building and a national historic site of Canada. Um, so if you're in the neighborhood, I would definitely encourage you to check out the chapel and cemetery grounds and you can also walk along the Rosedale Ravine. Like I said before, in the beginning, most of St. Jamestown was forested farmland and unoccupied. The neighborhood was at the edge of the city at the time and, and was considered to be the country. Main access to the neighborhood from the south was by Sherburne, Ontario and Parliament Streets. The first phases of residential development occurred in the late 19th century when the lands were subdivided and sold. You can see from some of these early fire insurance plans, um, they help show how the neighborhood developed. On the right, uh, this is what it would have looked like in 1858. Lots are just being subdivided and, and starting to be sold. And then by eight, the 1880s, there were, more, um, there were more homes in the area and onwards into the late 1800s and then the early 90s. 1900s. If you can imagine, the neighborhood streets would have been lined with Victorian homes. Um, but now if you're in the neighborhood, you can see new buildings being developed in their place. Next, we'll talk about one of the few Victorian homes left in the neighborhood. And then we can learn a little bit more about 19th century history of St. Jamestown and what the area might have looked like back in the late 1800s. Imagine we're now on Howard Street. What you're looking at is um, the intersection. You're standing at the corner of Sherburne Street and Howard. 
It's a good way to see St. Jamestown past and present um, because you can see um, so, some, some red brick buildings from the Victorian age in the early 1900s. You can see the towers of the mid-century um, to the right. And then on, on the left, on the north side of Howard Street, you can see new buildings uh, um, being built and under construction. So how did St. Jamestown develop? How did it transition from the Victorian era to the modern age? Before St. Jamestown became one of North America's most densely populated neighborhoods, it was an upper middle class community, very similar to Rosedale in the north. By the 1870s, public transit was introduced on Sherburne Street with a streetcar route that operated in a loop on Sherburne, Bloor, Spadina, and King Street. The expansion of transit north of the downtown encouraged Toronto's wealthy families to settle in neighborhoods like St. Jamestown and Rosedale, building homes in the neighborhood. The late 1800s was a period of growth for the St. Jamestown area. At the time, Bloor Street ended at Sherburne, so many of the houses built on Howard Street had lots that extended all the way into the ravine, the Rosedale Ravine, backing on to Rosedale residences. The house that we'd be standing in front of, known as the William Whitehead House, was originally located further east at 76 Howard, near the intersection of Howard and Rose Streets. If you were on the ground, you'd be able to see that the area is uh, well under construction, and it's the building that, that I would have shown you in the previous photo on the left side. As part of the work allowing for the redevelopment of those lands, the house was relocated onto the new site at 28 Howard Street and restoration work took place in 2016. As you can imagine, moving a building is no easy feat, so of course someone took a video and I'm hoping to share that with everyone today. Um, the video was undertaken by ERA Architects, who was the heritage consultant or is the heritage consultant involved in um, the redevelopment of the lands north of Howard Street. So I'm going to play the video and hopefully the sound comes on and everything is good. I'm a principal of the ERA Architects. Uh, we're a, a firm that uh, works with cultural heritage. This project involves the move of a, a building from 76 Howard up the street westward to uh, a, a site about a block and a half away. This was part of a, a neighborhood uh, that is mostly gone at this point. Uh, there were about 20 buildings that were on either side of this building that have been torn down for a number of decades, this being the remaining building on that site. There's a, a number of consultants. A lot of things about us as a culture that are recorded in these buildings and when we tear these buildings down then we, we lose that record.
Wasn't that cool? I hope the the sound worked. Um, I was trying to make sure the sound was up. Um, but as a side note, the house is actually currently for sale. So in case you have an extra $4 million lying around, feel free to uh, check it out online. So with the extension of Bloor Street to the Prince Edward Viaduct in 1914 to 1918, St. Jamestown was now cut off from the neighborhoods to the north. In the 30 years that would follow, development slowed in the area due to the Great Depression and World War II. Later on, a lack of housing during the war was made worse by the baby boom. So in order to address housing needs, many of the grand homes in the area were converted into boarding houses. This conversion typically meant that a large home would be cut up into smaller apartments where tenants shared bathrooms and other rooms. Rooms could be rented by the week or month, so boarding houses were a, a, a flexible option for those who struggled to afford a typical apartment or didn't have a stable income. But boarding houses in Toronto at the time weren't really a great place to be. Rats and mice were common and tenants often complained about a lack of heat in the winter and faulty plumbing or wiring. These poor conditions in the neighborhood were well known at the time and, and even a, a city councillor stated that people shouldn't be living there. Soon, much of the neighborhood was considered to be an eyesore, and by the mid-20th century, the city was anxious to redevelop the neighborhood. Around this time in the 50s and 60s, much of the Western world, and particularly North America, was experiencing a shift towards the practice of urban renewal. Many times this meant that a lot of cities were starting to look to redevelop their inner city neighborhoods. In Toronto, urban planning trends of the time shifted dramatically away from the style of development that defined old Toronto or the Victorian age and towards what's called a towers in the park model. This model of development was often used in urban renewal projects as it was seen as an efficient and responsible way to maximize land. Next, I'll dig a little bit more into these planning theories and how they influenced the first wave of redevelopment in St. Jamestown back in the 50s and 60s. Urban renewal was an example of a technical planning theory that took a very bureaucratic and top-down approach to community building. Conceptually, cities assumed that there was a very clear definable problem, which was blight and poor living conditions, and that there was a single solution. This would be the revitalization Re revitalization of an entire community. But in order to get to the solution, this meant that everything needed to be raised to the ground and rebuilt. The rise of the modernist movement coincided with urban renewal's rise in popularity. One of the leaders of the modernist movement was a man named Le Corbusier, whose name you might have heard. He was born Charles Edouard Genret and he was a Swiss-born architect who enjoyed working with concrete and believed that the house was a machine for living in. Le Corbusier is most known for, known for the towers in the park concept, which we see replicated in the 60s towers of St. Jamestown. Towers in the park emerged from Le Corbusier's modernist concept of the radiant city. The radiant city concept was a reaction against the messy and dirty industrial city of Paris, as an example, against its narrow streets and minimal expo exposure to sun. Towers in the Park was intended to be a solution to problems of pollution and overcrowding in cities, and it was thought that it would offer the ben benefits of an abundance of green space and sunlight while maintaining very high densities by building upwards. Although the concept was rooted in good intentions, it didn't always work out in implementation. As the popularity of the Towers in the Park model grew, people soon realized that the model wasn't necessarily conducive to social interaction, and there was a, a lack of connectivity um, in these tower neighborhoods and beyond the tower neighborhoods. Buildings were essentially just kind of 
plot down in the middle of large swaths of green space, often with dead end streets leading to parking um, with a few pedestrian pathways or connected streets, which was a major issue. Urban renewal and the towers in the park model were implemented in a number of public housing projects across North America. And these issues were pervasive and, and created somewhat undesirable and potentially dangerous places to live for residents. Many of these kinds of housing developments ended up being demolished, such as Pruitt Igo in St. Louis and Regent Park South here in Toronto, which is currently under development. The towers you see in St. Jamestown probably feel somewhat familiar since they're ubiquitous across the GTA. In Canada, the towers in the park model was supported in various ways by the, Can the Canada Mortgage and Housing Company or CMHC during the residential boom um, following World War II. CMHC encouraged the construction of apartments over single family housing and their mortgage programs incentivized as much open space as possible on each lot. In the 1950s, the City of Toronto made major zoning amendments in the downtown core, allowing for significant increases in density in St. Jamestown, uh, which attracted a number of private developers. By the end of the 1950s, a group of developers, including Belmont Construction and Canadiana Investments, had bought up and demolished a majority of St. Jamestown's Victorian housing stock in order to develop the plan you're seeing on the screen and to construct some of Toronto's very first high-rise residential apartment towers. Also around, around the 1950s, young people were experiencing a societal shift since it was a new era when single people were no longer expected to live at home until marriage. Many of them began to live independently in, in rental housing. And so in response to this shift, St. Jamestown was actually initially redeveloped to attract the affluent swinging single set, which is what they called them, with some of the buildings boasting amenities geared towards urban singles, such as parties, a ski club, and communal TV rooms in the basement. On the screen, you'll see an interesting ad used back in the day to attract new renters to apartments in St. Jamestown. The new towers in St. Jamestown were named after Canadian cities. These include the Toronto building on the east side of Ontario Street, the Quebec at 730 Ontario Street, and the St. John's at 700 Ontario Street. If you walk around the neighborhood looking at building entrances, I'm sure you'll find some others. The two 14-story buildings called Quebec and St. John's were the first high-rises in the area, introducing over a thousand new apartment units. These buildings were located close to the center of the neighborhood. Um, three other buildings followed and were built on the west side of Parliament Street with a combined 711 units. Eventually, Belmont Construction and Canadiana Investments merged into Howard Investments and went on to build 10 other apartment buildings in the area. This company is now known as Medallion, uh, who's one of the major landowners in the neighborhood. By 1970, there were 10 private and four publicly owned high-rise apartment buildings. The publicly owned buildings were operated by the Ontario Housing Corporation. Um, by 1975, the west of St. Jamestown proposal constructed three additional high-rise towers with a total of over a thousand units. Between the 1950s and 1970s, 21 residential towers were built in St. Jamestown, four public and 17 privately owned. And that's how St. Jamestown has become one of Toronto's and Canada's densest neighborhoods. Today, St. Jamestown doesn't necessarily attract the affluent swinging single set, but instead it's provided a convenient landing pad and, and home to many new immigrants and lower income families. I found this really awesome drone footage that we're all watching on YouTube by user named Branislav Konka. It provides incredible views of the neighborhood and gives you a sense of what it might like what it might be like to walk around the neighborhood surrounded by all these mid-century high-rise towers, but also seeing the new development popping up on the fringes of the neighborhood. 
neighborhood. And you can also see just how close you are to the downtown. There were some shots of, of the neighborhood with the, with the CN Tower in, in, in the back, backdrop. So while we might not be able to be in the physical space, I thought this might be the next best thing. Right now, we're actually zooming in on the Rose Avenue Junior Public School, which we'll talk about next, and was one of the few buildings spared from the 1960s wrecking ball. In 1962, the Canadian immigration system was overhauled to limit racial discrimination. In 1967, Ottawa introduced a point system to rank potential immigrants for eligibility. The point system generally favored education and skills and the selection of immigrants to this country. And as a result, immigrants migrating to Canada were much more diverse than ever before. And the multicultural Toronto we know now began to take shape. As the affluent singles left St. Jamestown, less well-off and mainly immigrant families moved in. As of today, about 18,600 people live in St. Jamestown. Half the population are immigrants and two thirds identify as part of or, or multiple visible minority population. Visible minority populations and the highest numbers in this neighborhood include South Asian, Filipino and black, which is why Tagalog, Tamil and Nepali are the most common non-English languages spoken in the neighborhood, representing immigrants from the Philippines, India, Sri Lanka, and Nepal. The Rose Avenue School was one of the few buildings spared the wrecking ball in the urban renewal vision of the 60s. In St. Jamestown, the Rose Avenue Junior Public School has become a significant space within the neighborhood. On the left, you'll see the building originally built in 1883, which was designed in a modified Queen Anne revival style by architect David Brash Dick for the amount of $8,500 at the time. Since then, it's continuously operated as a school for over 130 years. Um, and in 1922, the school that you can now see if you're walking through the neighborhood, um, it was constructed to replace the original building. Today, the Rose Avenue Public School is a re representative slice of the greater St. Jamestown neighborhood. It serves a student population of over 700 students from kindergarten through grade six. More than 85% of the students cite English as their second language and represent about 50 language groups. Most students' families are new arrivals from other countries with many from Sri Lanka, the Philippines and, and from other countries in Eastern Europe, Asia and, and Africa. The school's frontage was never originally designed as a community parquet, but it's become a common community gathering space. It's quite well located close to the center of the neighborhood on a pedestrian only strip of Ontario Street with some of the few balcony list units in the neighborhood uh, looking onto the parquet. In 1989, this parquet was identified as a priority area and an informal community meeting space within the neighborhood as part of the city's community impro improvement program. The parquet and school have continued to serve its po population well and in 2007, a, a children's garden was developed at the northwest corner of the property. Here, they produce food for the community and the students learn how to garden and compost. Over the years, the city has acknowledged that this neighborhood has a shortage of, of good quality open spaces and amenities. So St. Jamestown has been the subject of a number of different plans and proposals to improve the spaces uh, in between all these tall buildings and create welcoming areas um, for community interaction and activity. Before we talk more about the high rises in St. Jamestown, I wanted to make a quick pit stop by one more remnant of the neighborhood's past. Before us is the New World Coin Laundry. For the developers in the 50s and 60s, buying up land from individual homeowners wasn't an easy task. Although many homeowners ended up selling their homes, along the way there were some holdouts. One such holdout was the owner of a semi-detached home at 600 Parliament Street um, named Lucio Casaccio. His family had owned the building since the 1910s, running a tailoring business. 
when the developers came knocking at his door, um, Casaccio refused to sell in unless the developers paid him $100,000, which was more than twice what was paid for um, in the neighbor for the neighboring houses. The developer tried and tried to get him to sell, um, but he continued to refuse. And in the end, the developers ripped down the attached semi and built a Y-shaped 32-story building called the Halifax at 280 Wellesley Street East. As you can see, the building wraps around the old Casaccio home, now known as the New World Coin Laundry on Parliament. This house serves as a visual reminder of the community efforts and resistance against development in the 60s, but ultimately the developers won out. Today, the laundromat is run by Korean immigrants who renovated the building in 2012 and brought in new machines to serve the community. In some ways, the semi-detached continues to tell the story of the evolution of the neighborhood even after the owners, the original owners have left. If we were walking outside, you might notice that um, we're walking on the edges of the neighborhood and then there aren't a lot of direct roads and walkways through St. Jamestown. This was a typical design feature or perhaps a flaw of the towers in the park style neighborhoods creating a phenomenon called a super block. In recent years, there's been a shift towards increasing connectivity and kind of like breaking up these, um, these super blocks uh, through new development and improving parklands and, and open spaces in the neighborhoods. What's interesting about this particular neighborhood is that so much of it is privately held um, by those developers that, that, were, that I talked about in the beginning. The only public roads in the neighborhood are Howard and Bleecker Streets, and most of the open spaces are actually POPs, which are privately owned public spaces, and are on long-term leases to the city. Um, this makes it difficult to plan for more recreational spaces, uh, which are needed in the area. Many open spaces are also located above underground parking garages, um, which makes it difficult um, from a maintenance perspective. For years, residents of St. Jamestown have expressed concerns that the existing apartments are crowded and in need of major repairs, that the neighborhood suffers from overcrowding, lack of green and public spaces, poor building and community maintenance, and a general lack of resources for serving the large and diverse residential population. In 2010, there was a six alarm fire on the 24th floor of the building at 200 Wellesley Street which is one of the few publicly owned buildings in the neighborhood. The fire was caused by a cigarette that landed on a, a cluttered balcony and set the entire floor ablaze. The fire forced the evacuation of over 1200 residents for weeks and, and some others for months. And about 17 people were injured in the fire. Despite the fire, the community came together. In 2013, um, this side of the building that you're seeing, the south side, um, kind of close to looking onto Wellesley, was transformed into the world's tallest mural. This mural was undertaken and led by youth from the Sustainable Thinking and Expression on Public Space Initiative, Four Steps, um, and the St. Jamestown Community Corner. The mural depicts a phoenix rising from the ashes, much like St. Jamestown has. Themes of diversity, accessibility, safety, happiness, and other aspects of local culture are weaved into the lower sections of the, mural, of the mural. It took over a year of collaboration with the neighborhood youth, community members, and the artist, Sean Mardendale. In case you're wondering, it's been registered with the Guinness Book of World Records, so it's officially the world's tallest mural. What used to be a, a pretty unmemorable blank wall is now a community landmark and the upper portions can be seen from different parts of the downtown core. While community concerns about lack of amenities and needs for building repair still persist, different community-based organizations like the St. Jamestown Service Providers Network and the St. Jamestown Corner are working on the development and implementation of plans for a vibrant, safe and healthy community. These plans consider community safety, opportunities for income generation, needs of the youth and seniors communities, community engagement and access to health services. Uh, the St. Jamestown Corner 
also pro provides residents with community spaces uh, dedicated to local initiatives and services for the benefit of the neighborhood. Next, we'll talk about the old Wellesley Hospital site. Across from the street from the old hospital site is the neighborhood local library branch, um, which is an example of some of the community supports in the neighborhood that have been implemented in recent years in response to um, the lack of services and amenities. It was built in 2004, and there's a pool portion to the community center that was recently uh, finished and it's well used by the community. At the former Wellesley Hospital site, we're now at the southwest edge of the St. Jamestown neighborhood. Initially, this area was planned to be the midpoint in the neighborhood. In the 70s, the developers who built the towers in the park buildings had planned to extend St. Jamestown further south all the way to Carlton Street. A number of residents protested against this future development and some even chained themselves to buildings in protest. In the end, the lands that had been prepped for development were eventually occupied by nonprofit housing cooperatives, some of which you can see on the south side of Wellesley, um, providing affordable housing units through subsidies from CMHC and market rate units. Standing at the corner, you can tell that there's been a lot of change in the area in recent years. One of the projects that spearheaded this change was the redevelopment of the old Wellesley Hospital site. The Wellesley Hospital, which was the predecessor of the Wellesley Central Hospital, was founded as a private nonprofit hospital in 1911 by Dr. Herbert Bruce, a Toronto physician. It was located at the corner of Wellesley and Homewood Avenue, and it had 72 beds primarily serving wealthy Toronto residents. The fees paid by the wealthy then allowed the hospital to provide more affordable health care to the poor, and eventually the ho hospital became a public institution after World War II. In the 1950s, two physician brothers from Hungary named John and Paul Rakai immigrated to Canada and converted an old house at 331 Sherburn Street, just south of St. Jamestown, into a small hospital called the Central Hospital. Over the years that followed, the Rakai brothers focused on serving um, the, the, the diverse communities of Toronto by offering services in more than 30 different languages and providing uh, diverse cuisine to patients. The Central Hospital eventually became a public hospital as well and would go on to become one of the first truly multicultural public hospitals in Ontario. In 1997, the Central Hospital merged with the Wellesley Hospital and in 1998, the province closed the facility and combined it with St. Mike's. In 2000, the old hospital site was handed back to um, the Wellesley Hospital um, and its, its corporation, the Central Health Corporation, um, for redevelopment. This Central Health Corporation would later be known as the Wellesley Institute. The first phase of redevelopment consisted of the Rakai Center at Wellesley Central Place, so on the left. Um, which opened its doors in 2005 as a 150-bed long-term care facility. This facility became the first hospital-affiliated affi nonprofit nursing home in Toronto and was constructed to reflect a welcoming home-like environment with contained units surrounding green spaces with a green roof that's inhabited by honeybees. The second phase of redevelopment at the center of the screen was the Wellesley Central Residence, which provides 112 rent geared to income housing units, 50% of which are for people living with HIV AIDS, and the other 50% um, are for seniors. For phase three, at the right side of the screen of the redevelopment, um, the northern portion of the old hospital lands were sold to Tridel, who built a high rise building. Um, and the, the three different buildings are, are kind of connected by the Wellesley McGill Park between the Rakai Centers and the High Rise. When the hospital closed, a number of residents and local business owners suffered economically. Um, so in many ways, the redevelopment of the Wellesley Hospital site spurred the revitalization 
of the neighborhood that we're seeing continue today. Um, it brought more residents to, to the community and different kinds of re residents um, and added to the already existing diversity of uh, St. Jamestown. If you took a look, look around, you'd be able to see that a number of newer developments have popped up in and around the old hospital site. Um, one of the more interesting newer developments kind of west of St. Jamestown, I'd say, um, is the steam plant lofts, which is northwest of, of the old hospital site. It's a loft conversion project that occupies the old power plant that used to supply power to the Wellesley Hospital and the old Princess Margaret Hospital when it was located on Sherburn. It incorporates a 61 foot tall smokestack. So inside some of the units actually have curved bedrooms. The next stop is a quick stop before the very last stop of the tour. As participation in faith and religion decreases around the country, many places of worship are experiencing low attendance and difficulties maintaining their properties, especially in urban areas. However, Our Lady of Lourdes has been thriving with a strong immigrant community making up a majority of its congregants. With faith, faith an important aspect of life in different cultures and its location in the diverse St. Jamestown neighborhood, our Lady of Lourdes is a vibrant and diverse Catholic parish. The church caters to its community by providing services such as the Lourdes Food Bank and access to short-term assistance to residents in need. The church also hosts seven Sunday masses with one conducted in Tamil. When you look at Our Lady of Lourdes, it's a very distinct building along Sher the Sherburn Corridor and it's quite beautiful to look at. Our Lady of Lourdes was actually a gift from the clergy of the Archdiocese to the most Reverend John Joseph Lynch, who was the first Roman Catholic Archbishop of Toronto. The church was dedicated in 1886, but before then the surrounding area was known as St. John's Grove and had been the Archbishop's summer residence with a grotto that honored Our Lady of Lourdes. The original building um, was designed by Frederick Charles Law and modeled after the Santa Maria del Popolo in Rome. At the time of its construction, it was the only church to have a dome in Toronto. Um, and uh, some of the original portions of the building are, are partially uh, hidden by some um, alterations in 1910, which added the entrance portico that you see off of Sherburn. This stop is an opportunity to hear about a building that has changed over time to, to fit and serve the community, um, the surrounding community as it evolves. I can imagine that along with the other community supports in the area, many residents are happy to find a place of faith, spiritual refuge and welcoming community within these doors. So what's next for St. Jamestown? Throughout the tour, we talked about how St. Jamestown is going through a lot of change with a number of new developments in process in the neighborhood. Let's go to our next stop and talk a little bit about what you might see here in the future. We're now at the back at the corner of Howard and Sherburn Streets in front of the Guterham Mansion, also known as the Selby Hotel. And I think it's a fitting stop to bring the tour full circle. We started this tour talking about the neighborhood's past and now we're ending the tour talking about what's next for the community and how it's built history will be weaved into its future. This intersection of Sherburn and Howard will see a lot of new development in the near future. Looking around, you can see lots under construction. In fact, Three out of the four corners of this intersection will soon be occupied by high rises over 50 stories tall. At the northeast corner um, at 603 Sherburn, so on the left portion of the screen, there will be a 53 story condo tower that will incorporate existing heritage homes into the base of the tower, um, which will be used for ground floor retail and some amenity spaces for the building. At the southeast corner, so opposite from here, with this curved corner building, uh, the Medallion Corporation, so one of the main property owners and developers of the existing mid-century towers in the neighborhood, 
will be building a 51 story residential rental tower. The new development will retain the existing corner commercial building and will integrate it into the new building. On top of that, the developers will contribute to the improvements of the adjacent uh, St. James Town West Park Pops, which is just at the edge of, of, um, of the property, improving an existing open space and adding to community amenities. And of course, in front of us on the west side of Sherburne, we have the Selby and the James Cooper Mansion developments, which both incorporate heritage buildings into their bases. The Selby was completed in 2018, but before it came the Selby, it became the Selby, it was the Guterham Mansion, a home initially built for Henry Falwell Guterham. Henry would then sell the property to his brother, Charles Horace Guterham, um, and both Henry and Charles were part of the Guterham family, known for co-founding the Guterham and Wartz Distillery, which was once one of the largest distillers in Canada, and of course makes up the buildings in the distillery district that we now know today. Architecturally, the Gouda Mansion is a grand example of the Queen Anne revival style with its asymmetrical profile, intricate detailing and extensive use of brick with limestone accents. It'd be great if we were there in person and you could kind of see, uh, see the building in, in physical form. The building also features a two-story bay window at the northeast corner um, with large decorative wood brackets, a varied roofline with protruding dormers and detailing, including corbelled brick chimneys and brick patterning. In terms of historical use of the original building, Branksome Hall, a notable all-girls school in Toronto, once operated out of the Guterham Mansion before moving to its location on Mount Pleasant. And in 1913, the property was sold and converted into the Selby Hotel. Initially, the Selby Hotel operated as a private hostel that catered to elder, elderly women, but in 1920, it became a public hotel. Interestingly enough, Ernest Hemingway lived in the hotel for a while while uh, with his wife, Hadley, while he was working as a foreign correspondent for the Toronto Star back in the 1920s. Through the years, the Selby Hotel evolved as the surrounding neighborhood also evolved. In the 80s, it was home to Boots, one of the most popular and long lasting gay clubs in Toronto, providing a link to the nearby Church Wellesley Village neighborhood. The Selby would go on to change hands a few times over the years, becoming a Howard Johnson, then a Clarion Hotel. Although the hotel went through many evolutions and changes, parts of the interior remained with the original Victorian decor. Same as the adjacent James Cooper Mansion to the south, the Guterham Mansion was relocated closer to Sherburne Street from its original location in order to accommodate the 50 story tower, the 50 story condo that you see rising behind it. What's most interesting about the Guterham Mansion is that um, unlike the James Cooper Mansion, the building was restored to create a space that is more accessible to the public and can be used by the public more regularly now that it's been transformed into the Maison Selby restaurant. The restaurant uh, space retains some of its original Victorian features and the refreshed interiors are really beautiful. On the other hand, uh, James Cooper Mansion, the original building actually houses amenity space for the residents in the building. So it, it's not as accessible to the public. Um, and of course, if you happen to take a walk through the neighborhood after this tour, I'd encourage you to, to grab a seat at the Maison Selby restaurant and, and check it out. Um, Pre-COVID, I was able to, to spend some time there and, and the interiors are, are beautiful. Going back to the future of the intersection, when thinking about these recent and upcoming tower developments in comparison to the towers and the park buildings that make up St. James Town, they almost seem to be on opposite ends of the spectrum. On one hand, mass demolition of Victorian buildings was necessary in, in order to accommodate the vision of the 60s. 
On the other hand, this intersection will be able to tell a different kind of story, showing how the history and historic fabric of a neighborhood can come together to support new buildings. It also shows how priorities and approaches to development have changed in the city over the past 50 to 60 years. In some ways, the 1960s was about erasing the past, blight was an issue that needed to be solved, and the solution was to remove everything and start from scratch. Now, I think we're beginning to take a little bit more of an intentional approach to telling the stories of the past through the built environment. While it's, it can sometimes be a fight to keep a building intact, these four corners demonstrate the possibilities and, and options for integrating the new with the old. It's important to acknowledge that the older mid-century towers of the neighborhood provide a distinct community identity, as well as essential affordable housing for um, a lo the local population. As we think about these new developments, it makes me wonder how will these new developments impact the existing community? Um, and would they result in any a displacement of existing residents and, and local businesses? Hopefully not, but I think you're always kind of bal balancing uh, or, or, or on, and it's always a balance um, and that new developments can often bring a totally different uh, perspective to a community. I hope that you take these final thoughts with you and start to think about the physical environment of your own community, how it's evolved over time and how the people who live there influence the neighborhood. Today, we talked about the history, evolution, and the built environment of St. Jamestown, and how the towers in the park model has distinguished St. Jamestown from surrounding neighborhoods. We learned about the influence of urban renewal and new developments, starting with the old hospital site in the neighborhood. And now we're ending the tour where the past meets the present and the future. I hope you've enjoyed your time with me and learned a little bit more about this part of Toronto. As you can see, there's a lot happening in this neighborhood with many, many changes to come. Thank you so much for spending this time with me. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, of course, I'll again encourage you to take some time to, to get out of your house and, and go physically explore um, and even find new places in the St. Jamestown neighborhood that we weren't able to cover today. Uh, these are a couple of photos from the very first in-person tour that I had done um, and um, the in-person tour uh, of this neighborhood in August. Um, I'll be hosting one more in-person tour um, on Sunday, September 26th at 10.30 a.m. And then after that, there is a very last uh, in-person tour of the St. Jamestown neighborhood for the season on Sunday, October 12th at 2 p.m. So feel free to tell your friends, uh, but thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Ori, for a great presentation. Um, we'll now open the door to Q&A. Uh, remember, you can ask a question using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Just before uh, I read the first question, um, I think it's really interesting to note that Le Corbusier designed uh, these point block tower concepts in order to create this city beautiful with the, the, uh, the, the void spaces between the buildings to be kind of urban design, but they Developers never did that. They just put spaces between. They didn't design the outdoor rooms like a square, a, a park, or a, like say Trinity Square Park or St. James Park, where they've actually been designed the exterior spaces as well as the interior spaces. And I think that's one of the big failures of St. Jamestown. And it's too bad that they, the city can't sort of take those over the way they would in a new development, say, You've got to donate all this parkland to the city and the city will develop it to being major park outdoor spaces amphitheaters like activity spaces and all those kinds of things and that part is a real shame i think so with that um if you don't i don't know if you have any comment on that but uh, i'm going to read some other questions for you no yeah I, I was just going to say like that's one of the difficulties with this neighborhood and and what makes it so distinct from others especially uh, as you're thinking about redevelopment of the neighborhood because so much of it is privately held. Yeah. And, and so, so the city um, 
I, I think the level of influence that the city has, it might not be as much as, as one would expect. Yeah. So the Q and A's are just thanking you for a great tour, the, the comments in there. I don't, oh, awesome. Thank I you. don't see any, there's several comments there. I don't see any other questions. So um, for that, on that note, I think I'd like to thank you again, Ori, for this presentation. And I'd also like to thank our 2021 presenting sponsor, TD, and our tour sponsors, Andrew and Sharon Himmel, and the Himmel family and the Ontario Association of Architects for making this tour possible. And if you enjoyed this tour, please be sure to check out the other great tours we're offering on this season, both virtually and in person. Details can be found on our website under What's On. And how to donate, Heritage Toronto is pr proud to be a donor-driven charity. Over the past year, donor support has allowed us to uh, continue serving Toronto by, prior to, by prioritizing emerging historian opportunities, developing new tours, and expanding di digital programming. If you believe in the importance of engaging with our past and share our position for Toronto, please take action and join our circle of donors or renew your support today. And then I see more uh, comments in the chat saying, thank you very much. They loved it. Great presentation. So thanks again, Ori. Really interesting. And uh, we'll look forward to the next one. Thank thanks. So. Thanks all.